Guam Streets on a beautiful Wednesday morning out there. It's a beautiful day to go and be productive, beautiful way to get the economy back on track, beautiful way to amass knowledge. And of course, that's what our beloved teachers, administrators, faculty members, anybody who works in school, we have so much reverence for them. We, of course, had GDOE Superintendent John Fernandez on a few moments ago talking about what's going on with the public school system. And as always, uh, we extend the invitation right here on the link to our private school Friends, of course, they are working just as hard, making sure that they run their schools, educating the great young minds of tomorrow. And we welcome back to the KOM News Zoom Room all the way over in Principal Jeremy Zajic of Harvest. Is Harvest technically, is it Mung Mung Toto or Mighty? I always get that confused. Uh, a total, I believe, yeah. Okay. We, we, have, oh, uh, we have the privilege of both mayors calling us, which is awesome. We love that. Very <laughs> nice. Okay. And and no, no, uh, no reservations about uh, where the wonderful home of the Friars, uh, Principal Timo Perez, is over here. Fortis in Fide. I did not graduate from FD. I do not have the privilege, but I've always had immense respect for anybody who has uh, donned the FD uniform because just like GW we were talking about last month, they beat me all straight four years in my homecoming. So that's my high school memory. <laughs> But but of course, you know, uh, athletics and, you know, and, you know, kind of like uh, uh, making light aside and everything like that. The, the challenge of being able to run a, a private educational institution continues and everything. And, and gents, when last we spoke and everything, you were talking about, um, you know, some of the uh, challenges and um, obstacles that you face, but that you continue to power through as far as testing and running, um, you know, your normal school operations with the restrictions in hand and everything. So uh, maybe if we can just start this, can you give us like an, an update on where that's been and are things getting any easier? Well, um, let's start with yeah, an easy think, one, Jeremy. Think, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's super easy. I think we're in a, we're kind of in a new normal period and uh, uh, we have, we have adjusted to our operation. Um, we of course appreciate the opportunity to, uh, by the governor um, and the leadership to remain open yeah, yeah, there's challenges, uh, just like there is in the community, um, but we work through those challenges. Uh, we believe that, you know, face-to-face -face education is so important to our kids. And so trying to follow all the protocols, mitigation measures, um, and uh, and then react when we need to if we do have a case. Um, but yeah, the kids are thriving. The kids are starting to come out of their shells, uh, which, is a, which is a great thing. They're starting to talk again, communicate with each other, communicate with teachers, and uh, starting to, I, I think, close some of that learning gap too, which is which is going to be super important for the next couple of years. In your observation, Jeremy, was there any sort of like maybe readjustment period, um, primarily for the students, but maybe even for, you know, faculty and administrators just to say like, okay, well, now we're, we're in the same physical space. And, you know, this is kind of what I remember from, you know, going on two years ago. Yeah, it doesn't feel quite normal, right? So you, we're always, you know, obviously wearing masks still. There's plexiglass on every desk. So if you're in the front of the classroom, the poor kids in the back are getting glare, you know, from the windows. And it's it's just not a normal environment, but we're doing mm -hmm. the best that we can. Um, I would say socially, it took an adjustment uh, for our kids. Um, you know, being being isolated for an extended period of time, some are comfortable with that, some craved it. And so it's been interesting to see. I teach 10th grade life skills. Um, and one of the things noticing coming back this year was just an apprehension of just interaction, or just kind of forgetting, you know, some of those habits. And, uh, you know, it comes back pretty easily. So um, we, we do trimesters for our life skills class and I just got the new class in, which is great. I teach all 10th graders for the entire year then. Um, and, the, and this group is much more talkative. So it's back to uh, the classroom management of keeping of keeping the noise down, working through those things. But it is, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to see the kids rebound. Um, and uh, I think we still have some work academically to do with our kids across the board, you know, all grade levels. Um, but uh, but grateful to be back face to face, even if it's a little bit weird. All right, very well. How about at the home of the Friars, uh, Mr. Paris? How how is the Brotherhood, um, you know, continuing, you know, the tradition of learning, and you know, of course, it is being a Catholic school, you know, respect and um, and making sure that you represent your family as well as you know, excel in the classroom and everything like that. You know, goes generations back. You know, how how has that uh, tradition at FD, you know, been impacted by these these weird new restrictions that we've had to deal with? It's uh, good that you brought up the brotherhood part. Um, you know, a very big part of our experience is the community we build here at the school. Um, it's a very different place to be at an all boys school, of course, um, or crazy at times. But the experience being on campus with everybody is is a big part of our experience. Mm -hmm. And right now we've got pretty much all of our kids on campus. Um, there's only like one holdout trying to stay online. 
but I did send an email out this weekend saying that we aren't really doing online um, learning or distance learning the, in the um, way that people expect it to be synchronous. Um, so the kids that are quarantined or isolated, you know, we want them to come in when they're ready, when they're cleared. Um, but eventually it's going to be how we did in the 90s. It's going to be you have to um, make up the work when you can um, because our, our platforms, you know, everyone's pretty, pretty much on campus. It's really only one student trying to um, stay. Um, so we really need to look at the idea. Is it, is it wanting to come on campus for COVID reasons or not? Um, but yeah, they're, they're here. There's a, a bunch of things going on. We've got our, our teams up and running. We've got football, cross country, um, soccer's going on. All of them are, are in full force right now. Um, so our kids are back to pretty much normal. Of course, we're wearing masks, washing our hands, washing our hands, watching our distance. We're doing all of that um, just to make sure we're following the protocols and keeping everyone safe. And we've even moved, um, you know, our, our testing capability is much more stringent. So we've got testing for our students, their families, if we need, we've got students from other Catholic schools as well coming in, parishes coming in. Um, we've helped other schools as well. Um, some other private schools had, if they wanted, they, they would send students over. We try to work with them as much as we can. So we're, we're, we're making sure that we follow protocols and um, increasing the testing capability of our school um, because we want our students to come back on campus. And like Jeremy said, it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit different, but it's still, we're trying to move in the direction of getting our kids back to socialization. Um, and it, they, they do forget sometimes that they're not behind a screen and they can't turn off their camera and their microphone. Um, it takes a little bit of learning for the teachers and the students to, to be, you know, physically present to each other. Indeed. But pretty much all our students are on campus now. Yeah. Um, and even vaccination rates, they're, they're really helping because if we have a positive that's reported to our school, we're able to mitigate real quickly and say, if you're fully vaccinated, the guidelines say you don't quarantine, you don't have to quarantine, you don't have to test. So with an, an uh, almost 90% vaccination rate on our campus, we've got a pretty good way to get our students right back in if we have a positive that turns out. So I think we're moving in a very good direction at our school. All right, very well. And and I I appreciate uh, Mr. Paris how you brought up you know like uh, you know physical education being equal uh, equally as important as uh, you know classroom activity. By the way, everybody, FD still undefeated after beating um, Guam High uh, last week. So congratulations on that on that, sir. <laughs> And um, one of my colleagues, um, uh, Sabrina salas Matanani, of course, is here is, as well as Isaiah Uggins. So, uh, Isaiah, do you have any questions for the gentleman? Okay, uh, Mr. Perez, you mentioned that you guys uh, started COVID testing students, is that correct? We do test students, yes, especially if there's a case at home or um, some exposure they've been um, experiencing. And we've been doing that since the beginning of the school year, practically. Um, they're okay. testing pretty much every day, even on Saturday sometimes. Are you guys in scheduled cohorts? And what is your guys' uh, vaccination rate uh, amongst your students and staff? Do you guys have that information available? So we, we don't have cohorts. Um, it's really hard with the variation in schedules with all the AP classes and different types of electives. So we don't actually cohort right now. Um, our vaccination rates, as your, uh, for your question, with the teachers and staff, it's uh, 96%. Um, on average, for students, it's about 88%. Awesome. Um, and then Mr. Pastor Jeremy Zajic, did you guys begin COVID testing your students and staff as well? We've taken a bit of a different approach where we rely uh, heavily on the parents from a testing standpoint. There's there's ample testing in the community. Uh, we are working through, because there's a requirement in the, in the latest DPHS regulations of screening testing. There's a lot of complications with that. Um, when you think about the age of student that we have from really th three years old up through seniors in high school. Um, there has to be proper consent in place when we, you know, when, when we're when we're performing essentially like m minimally invasive um, procedures, medical procedures. And so there's some legal things I've been working through, look, working through some also some alternate options with our parents. One of the things that we really highlight at our, at our school is just parental involvement. <clears throat> and so um, we we ask our parents to be involved in that. There are times when uh, the vaccination um, you know vaccination status comes into play when we are notified of a a positive case. Uh, then we immediately do our contact tracing by by consulting our records uh, of who's within six feet of this individual at all times of the day, um, and then communicating with our parents uh, if they were in a direct contact or if it's in the grade level if they were not in direct uh, contact, uh, just provide some peace of mind. So. So that's been our approach. Um, still in the process of developing that screening testing protocol, which which DPS 
uh, DPHS has asked us to do. Uh, but there's a few unanswered questions that we're still waiting to get some answers on from uh, from that group. And what are some of those questions that you guys have for public health? Yeah, I would I would say the legal component is is pretty big. Um, uh, you know, oftentimes. Um, you know, you, can't, you don't necessarily send your child to the doctor, you, you go with them, right? And so testing, testing a child without their parent uh, there um, is, uh, yeah, that's a consideration. Um, of course, you know, vaccinations are required of all different types to come to school from, you know, from a, from, from a TB test to different things. We tend not to do those things because we want our school nurse to be viewed as someone that's not super scary. And so uh, all of those things can be accomplished um, through parental involvement. And so that's what we highlight. We ask parents to be involved in it. We respect their rights, their privacy along with that. And so that's another component is just, is just the minor element of it. Um, and, uh, and then the actual, um, you know, from, from the standpoint of resources, um, yeah, we don't have the resources yet to implement wide scale testing um, there needs to be an op, uh, opportunity for parents to, to opt into that. Uh, we know that we'll have, you know, some parents that don't want to opt into that, and that's fine. Giving them the choice uh, is uh, is what we're about. So, so those are some of the questions, really resources, and then just some legal components associated with it. Okay. Um, Mr. Paris, uh, going back to you, um, some schools began testing their students recently, and some don't have the resources. Um, I'm curious, is, are you anticipating a shortage of testing? kits for your students and staff? Well, the test kits we have, um, you know, they're provided by public health. So we, we try to get them as often as we can. Um, and even some of the PPEs that we're required to wear during testing. Um, they've been pretty good about getting us most of the things we need. Some things we're still trying to work with them on. Um, it's been a couple of months, but we are trying to get them to uh, meet us on the things they told us we'd be able to get. Um, but test kits wise, we're, we're pretty good. We have gotten the test kits we need, so we should be okay. Um, how many COVID positives have you guys reported since the start of the school year? Um, let me just check that real quick. We don't uh, we don't publish a new number, and it's not you know for any other reason that they're already included in the public numbers that are released. Um, you know, when we have a positive, we communicate within the grade level if they were in contact with someone or not within contact with someone. So. It's not, uh, we don't publish uh, an extra rate on top of things. For okay. us on our side, um, our students, we only had six students test positive at, at any point during the school year. Um, and it's it hasn't been very um, interruptive of the school uh, schedule because most of our kids, you know, get to go back because they're not um, having to quarantine. But if you're looking at the testing site that we run, we've tested over um, 1,100, it's 1,100, about, 1,086 people have been tested here, and of those, 52 have been tested positive. But they're not students or parents or necessarily. They're, they could be from the community because a lot of them, we've been supporting um, other schools and um, organizations to be able to get those tests run. So with our own students, it's only been about five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Sabrina or Jason? Okay, yeah, I, I got one. Gentlemen, um, would you... Would you care to shed light on on how the last maybe the last year in particular um, has it had any negative or substantially negative uh, impacts on your enrollment? Because obviously, by your nature as as private schools, that is a concern, and you know the the, the money brought in through tuition helps your operations and expansion, um, that kind of thing. And the only reason I ask is because I know of at least um, uh, two private schools that have reached out to me, and they said the net effect of what we had last year and this, the measures we put in place and the way we were able to get through last year, that actually increased enrollment. And, they, and a lot of parents said, I was very, very impressed on how this school handled this and everything like that. I would like to send my kid there and, and I do that with confidence. So has, has there been like a, like a similar experience at, at either of your schools? Yeah, when we were uh, when we were all online, we saw we saw a, a pretty significant decrease in enrollment um, when it became apparent that you know it's going to be online for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. um, I would say this year we we increased enrollment from that low of about eighteen percent, and so um, I think there there are still families that are hurting. I think the economics of our island plays into that. Um, I think there's people that that want to be part. Um, but just don't have the finances, and so it'll be interesting to see as our economy rebounds that some of those you know, some of those parents uh, are able to come back. 
Um, but there has been an impact, and uh, and that's and that's concerning. Um, but again, this year our enrollment's up about 18 percent uh, from the previous year, which is which is a positive thing. And to be fair, Jeremy, you have been one, like one of the preeminent voices about that that very concern on behalf of the entire private uh, school community, going all the way back to like last year. And you're like, like, look, you know, like this is you know not being melodramatic about it. This is an existential crisis yeah. for us. Yeah, we, we always want to be respectful in it. it. It's not just about the finances. I think I think God's going to provide for our finances, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if we're doing the right thing. So just highlighting the importance of of face to face education, demonstrating that we can do this in a safe and effective manner, and partnering with parents to mitigate, you know, as much as possible risks of COVID. Um, and so, yeah, we we've tried always to be respectful, but also be a voice too of just saying this is this is super important. There are so many pieces of data that, that are coming out about, it's called the COVID slide in education. Mm -hmm. And uh, just how uh, the effect, you know, if you think about kids learning to read during this past two years, man, that's not been a normal year for them, face-to-face uh, -face with a teacher and that relationship. Often, you know, the relationship with a teacher is what propels students to achieve beyond what they think is possible. You know, that's really tough to do mm -hmm. <laughs> through, uh, through technology, through video. You can do that face-to-face -face. and so, we're, we're excited, we're eager, we're back at it because I know, you know, our parents expect a lot out of us from an educational standpoint. And honestly, um, our kids do too. And we want to help deliver those things to them. Mm -hmm. How about at FD? Has, has the size of the student body increased, decreased in, over the last uh, school year? Yeah, so we've got um, about 25 more kids than we had before the pandemic. We've actually increased our enrollment. Um, so we're standing about 411 kids right now. Um, and part of the reason that we have an increase is there's there's this idea that we you know we try to move forward back to um in-person learning and some of the families that have come in to us that are new families have stated that they really appreciate that we moved in the direction of getting our kids on campus getting things back to normal you know pushing for sports to be um, an option again um so i think that's one of the, the components is we're, tr we're trying to get them back to normal as much as possible and parents are willing to you know invest in their students that way mm. so it's really important for us Okay. Now, now that having been said, have uh, I'm sure either of you, and maybe even with other private schools, have you guys kind of um, uh, tried to come up with some, uh, let's call it, creative solutions to maybe make um, more financing options available for parents who just say, you know, like Jeremy said, you know, we are really, really struggling, and my kid has maybe gone to your school of, at a number of years, but you know, I got furloughed, I got laid off, and everything, but I would really like my kid. Uh, to graduate, or you know, even to allow prospective students to go there, maybe things with scholarships or things of that nature expanding out yeah any um the first year of covid we actually offered a, a covid grant hardship uh, for some of our parents uh, as they finished up the year and that was that was that was super unique uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars was spent in that way um this year as we try to balance our priorities of um you know our, our teachers and our staff sacrificed a lot and we and we probably should and we should pay them a lot more for the the things that they do for our, for our for our families. You just became so the most popular them. guy on the internet by saying that one phrase there. Well, <laughs> raises for it's, teachers. It is, balancing, <laughs> it is balancing those priorities, and uh, we do try to work uh, with parents as well. Um, and so, if someone gets really behind on their bill, they actually have, they have a set up a meeting with me, and we in cer certain situations, depending on the circumstances, we develop payment plans to get them back on track and stuff like that. So. Man, uh, COVID has given us a lot of new challenges, um, and uh, one of those things is bills. And so, it's it's been my privilege to walk alongside families as they sort some of those things out. Mm -hmm. Now, Timo, have you had any uh, any guidance maybe from the archdiocese, or you know, um, I mean, I know you have a variety of uh, scholarship programs already, or you know, there are. Um, I mean, uh, you know, Chris Barnett has talked about there's there's even like a like an anonymous program that um, so some people have availed of over the years and everything. Um, are you considering okay. different financing options for? Uh, young men that want to become a friar and want to complete their high school education at FD? Yeah, so one of the things we did right at the start of the pandemic, um, I gave a tuition discount to students, but there was a catch. You had to um, complete a module and I gave them four different modules um, you know, divided by grade level. Um, so I wanted them to do some learning and it was like one was on investments, one was on entrepreneurship, another was on, um, I forget the other one, personal finance and investments. It was things like that. And if they did the module, they got a discount for their family. So it was on, you know, they didn't do it then. You obviously don't want the discount, um, but a lot of our kids did it. You know, they got the, the discount. The parents are happy about that. In addition to that, we have not raised tuition since before the pandemic. We've kept it low um, or where it was before the pandemic, at least. 
Um, and that's that's something I, I, I let the students know. We're operating, you know, a little bit more expensively, but we're keeping the costs low for the families because we want to make sure they have the means to send their kids um, without an increase in this in this tough time. Mm. Um, so it's been the same tuition since um, 20, 20, uh, 2019, I guess it is. Um, I don't know how long we've been in this pandemic now. It's been a long time. Mm. But we do have scholarships. Um, we have lots of scholarships that our students are applying for. Um, and this is something we've been doing every year. So even now the students are still applying and the families are, are making um, that an opportunity that they want to take advantage of. Okay. So we've got all of that. Going on. The diocese, um, yeah, we don't really have direction from them because we do control our finances in that part. Okay. Well, I, I do have one final question before I let you guys go, because of course it is a school day and, you know, like class is in session. <laughs> so before the bell rings, I just want to say, you know, because uh, both of your programs, again, as well as other private schools, you guys are college preparatory schools. Um, so how do you maintain, you know, that tempo? And, and even though it's been so challenging, so exhausting, um, so mentally brutal over the last year is maintaining that, that attitude and that tempo is, is, you know, telling juniors and seniors, you know, we're getting you ready for the next level and we will put you in, you know, a school and you will go on to, you know, be a productive member of society and successful and everything like that. I, I only imagine that's been a daunting challenge, but how do you, how have you been able to get that done? Yeah, I, I would say reminding students that there's life beyond high school. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> you know, in the pandemic, when your current circumstances become your reality, you have to remind students that, you know, at some point this will this will go away or, or, or we'll get used to it or something will happen but you still have to prepare for your future. And so a lot of our students uh, actually have great study habits, um, you know, and so a lot of, you know, our upperclassmen, they, they really understand, man, grades really matter. <laughs> grades matter in ninth through 12th grade. And if I, if, I, uh, if I slough off here a little bit, there's gonna be some lasting impact. So there has been, you know, moments of encouragement that we've had to encourage our students, but I would say largely they're doing a great job. Outstanding, great. Yeah, for us, we have, um... You know, we, we continue our college visits virtually. We've got other partners in the community doing the same thing, so we partner with them. Um, but I think really big in our campus is the relationship building, and it's letting kids know. Um, you know, you can talk to us when you have ready college college questions ready. Um, I just had a student in here this morning trying to do an extended absence thing, but in the meantime, I was like, "So, what's your plans for next year? What's your major going to be? What career you're looking at?" So it's really just building that relationship, which is, I think, the most important part of our community. Um, and that's why we push for in-person classes so much. The students need that social and emotional connection um, with, with good adults, with good um, mentor types. Um, so I think it's, we do college counseling, of course. We do um, talk to them in their classes very, very often about college and preparing for college and applications and such. But it's when you get the one-on-one -on -one and they actually get to ask questions that they really get that you know needed attention. So it's really about building relationships, I think, and encouraging them um because the things change they, they make decisions at 14 15 16 they don't know what they're doing a lot of times um so having that relationship with people who can guide them and let them know what direction they can take and what options available to them that really does help so personal connection and relationships are really important to us all right well timo perez and jeremy zajic from fd and harvest respectively uh, gentlemen thank you so much for your time and for uh for sharing some of the insight on on just how incredibly difficult and multifaceted it, it takes to run like a, a private school on guam and everything um you know with our our hats off to you and everything and you know our continued support for you guys appreciate it thank you Jason. okay and and, and timo uh, good luck hopefully uh, fd stays undefeated and jeremy i can't wait until harvest you know until until we can do like a, a harvest home home foot home football game too because you guys got that gorgeous soccer field and everything like that when yeah. you guys have, have oh, a football field too we're meeting them I, I will... tomorrow yeah we're meeting them tomorrow for soccer so we'll be uh at their home there you go. <laughs> when, when you when you guys have have a football field, I make you a problem. I will I will do your first game. I'm gonna call play by play. I can't wait. All right. That, that's a, that's a KUM promise and everything. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Have a wonderful day. All right, and please stay tuned, everybody, because we're gonna wrap up the show. The link continues right after this. This year, Giving Tuesday falls on November 30th. And though our community is still facing some of the most challenging of times, there's no 